Come on, church. Give God a shout of praise in this place. We love you, Lord. We praise you. For there is no one like you. Well, hey, I am excited for 2020. Who's excited for a new year? I believe that God has great things in store for us, for you. Today we're starting a new series called This Is My Year. How many are believing that, that this is my year? Some of you are happy to put the last year behind you. But I'm ready and excited for all that God has for us in this new year, in 2020. It's a special year for us, for this church, for you. And we're starting this series, This Is My Year, and it's all about starting some new habits to get some new results. And here's what I've seen. I think that change is easier than we think. A lot of us think change is difficult, but sometimes some small implementation of, dip, of little disciplines can yield big results in our life, big changes. And so I want to start today, we're going to be looking at habits throughout this series and what habits can do for us and in our lives. But we have to start today, we got to look at and talk about the why of our habits. Because I think a lot of us don't even understand why. Like, why do I do what I do? I'm talking about the bad things. Why do I make the choices that I make? And Paul actually lays this out because he experienced the same thing you experience. So I want to read Romans chapter 7. Paul is writing to the church in Rome. I know you've been standing, but can you stand for just a couple more moments in reverence for the reading of God's Word? I want to read from verse 15. It says, For I do not understand my own actions. This is Paul. You thought he was really spiritual. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. How many can relate to this? Like, you're like, why do I keep doing this? Jumping forward to verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Paul is speaking some of your language right now. Verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Listen, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This is a man that we've always looked at like, man, he, he's spiritual. He had it all together. And yet he says what a lot of you say all the time, like, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do the very thing I do want to do. He's speaking our language. And I think today God is going to really free us up to understand the why of the decisions that we make in our life every single day. God wants you to walk in the fulfillment and the fullness of the purpose and the call that He has for you. I think that a lot of us are not even scratching the surface of the capacity that we have to bring influence and change in this world. And so in this series, I believe God is going to free us up and change some things. So can we pray? Lord, I pray that you would speak to us from your word. May we understand the why of our habits. God, may we walk out of this place feeling freer than we came in, feeling more focused than we walked in these doors. Lord, we need you. We love you. And we're nothing without you. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Listen, high five three people and tell them, whoa, tell them, this is my year. Tell them, high five three people, tell them, this is my year. Hey, so good to see you guys. My name is Caleb. I'm one of the pastors here, and I have the blessing and opportunity to speak to you from God's Word today. But before we jump in here, I, I got to just set up what's happening over these next 21 days. Starting tomorrow, we are beginning 21 days of fasting and prayer. How many know that one of the blueprints of our church, one of our core values, is that prayer is our power? Did you know that God hears the cries of his people? That prayer actually changes things? Did you know that? Prayer works. Come on, somebody. Prayer works. 
And so I just want to challenge you over these next 21 days, starting tomorrow, going through the 27th, we are going to be praying and fasting. Now, what does that look like? That looks like whatever you want it to look like. That looks like giving up social media. That's what I'm doing starting tomorrow. I need to do it. I'm going to do it. It's going to free up a lot of time for me. I'm going to have a lot of time to pray. Come on. And uh, that means I'm going to be giving up a couple meals a week um, and, and designating and consecrating that time to God. I'm going to pray during those times. But what we're going to do, and so I want you to pull out your phones right now. Come on, get your phones out. Text 21 days of prayer to 97,000, and what you're going to get is a text every day, every day with the topic to pray for. So listen, maybe this means for you that you just wake up that morning, you get the text, and you pray for one minute over that topic. That may be all you can do in this season. I just want to challenge you, if that's all you can do, that you do it. But I would love it if we as a church, all of us, were focused on the same thing every day for the next 21 days. Not only that, we're going to have a couple prayer nights starting not this week, but next week that you can come to. We can corporately gather, pray, seek God. Um, But what would happen if God's people, the church, Project Church, prayed I believe God would move. So would you pray with us? Would you commit to praying, even if it's just a short amount of time every day, but you say, you know what, I'm going to pray over that topic every single day. So make sure you text that. You can actually sign up to get the email too if you prefer an email, if that's easier for you, or a text to your phone every morning that will tell you this is what we're praying for, a scripture to really set the day off and uh, focus us as a church. So you with me? Come on, let's do this. Okay. We're jumping in here today, new series, This Is My Year, and and I said it to you earlier, that I believe that change is possible. And a lot of us in this place don't like change. Um, Some of you don't like change, but how many know change is inevitable? Like, you can't stop it. Um, You can't stop change. It happens. Um, You know, a couple years back, my beard was black, and and now it's gray. You know, you can't stop change. It just happens. But we can be more intentional to get the change that we actually want in our life. The changes that will actually set our life on a new trajectory. And in this series, we're going to look at establishing some new habits that are necessary to enable us to become all that God wants us to be. And so we're declaring that this is my year. And I believe for this to be your year, all it will take is you being intentional of implementing some small disciplines into your life to receive the big results that God wants you to have. So here's a breakdown of the series. Check it out on the screen behind me. Today we're talking about the why of my habits. Next week we're talking about starting good habits. Week three, stopping bad habits. And week four, sustaining right habits. All right? So I want to encourage you, come back these four weeks. If you can't be here every week, that's okay. You can watch online. Make sure you go to YouTube or our website, pridechurch.com, or you can listen on our podcast. We have a podcast on iTunes or Spotify and catch up on all the messages. Make sure you're locked in on this series because I believe that this series is going to launch us and propel us to have an amazing 2020. Come on, church. Um, I believe it. So I want you in this with me. Let's do this. I already read from Romans chapter 7. But we're going to be jumping around in there in Romans. But I've always had some bad habits in my life. And I don't know, this first one, I don't know if I'd call it a bad habit. It's just been who I am. But my whole life, I've slept in. Like, I'm just not a morning person. Is anybody with me? You're just not a morning person. Like, I wake up early in the morning and it hurts. You know, like my body hurts. I sleep in and I feel great, right? And so last year, my wife actually challenged me. She was like, Caleb, you're 37 years old and you're still sleeping in. And I used to always say that's why I got so tall. I'm taller than my whole family and I blame it on all the sleep I got. Um, But she's like, you're not growing anymore. Um, You don't need to sleep in. We have little kids. You need to start waking up. My wife wakes up at 5 a.m. every morning to go to the gym. She's a psycho like many of you. And uh, so I said, all right. So last year, at the start of the year, I set my alarm for 6.30 a.m. And I set every weekday, 6.30 a.m. The first week, I turned it off every day. Went off, turned it off. But what happened was the second week, there was a couple days where I actually woke up and I was awake and I got up. And then the third week, I started to wake up before my alarm went off. And before I knew it, I was waking up most of the time 
at 6.30 a.m. and starting my day because I had time before my kids got up, I was able to spend time in prayer, spend time in the Word. And I, my whole life, my mantra had been, Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening according to Genesis, and that's when I spend time with God. But let me tell you, you could do that. I'm about that. But it was good for me to start my day with God. And so I implemented that, this new habit, in 2019, and it really strengthened my life. It helped me in a big way. Three years ago, I decided that I was going to read the Bible through in a year. Now, that's not easy if you just grab the Bible in the morning and go, okay, I'm going to read this thing through in a year. But I got the app, the YouVersion Bible app, and I subscribed to a plan, and every day it told me this is how much you need to read. And actually, it only took me about 10 to 12 minutes every day, and I was able to read through the Bible in a year. I've now done it three years in a row. I do a different version of the Bible every year I do it. And let me tell you, it's yielded great fruit in my life. Not only that, but this last year I said, you know what? I want to read more, um, read more books. So I'm not going to watch TV at night. I, I spend too much time on Netflix. I'm going to read a book every night before I go to bed. And let me tell you, I didn't do it. I love Netflix, okay? And uh, I binge watch heck of shows. And I still do. And so I just want you to know your pastor ain't perfect, okay? You set some goals and you don't meet them. But we all have habits. Some of them good and some of them bad. But the reality is that many of us are dealing with more bad habits than good habits. Many of us are dealing with what Paul experienced, and every day we're actually going, I, we're saying what Paul said, which is, I don't understand. Did you hear me when I read that? Paul's like, I don't understand. I don't do the very thing that I want to do, and that I do that which I don't want to do. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am. I mean, this is Paul talking. And I think many of you can relate to this because you're doing things. You're going, why am I doing this? And you're making choices. Why am I making these choices? But I think that understanding who we are is key to understanding how to change the habits and the choices that we're making. You see, when I know my why, I know how to try and some of you are going, well, I'm not supposed to try. God does it all for me. No, no, no. The Bible is clear that we're supposed to work, y'all. Like, we put our hand to the grind. We work. We work alongside of God. Jesus said, you're my hands and feet. The first command he gave to man, he told Adam, he said, work the garden. Subdue it, right? Work on it. Toil on it. We are a people called to work alongside of God. For us to establish and have the right kind of habits, we have to know our why. If we know our why, then we'll know how to try, how to, how to let out the effort, the right kind of effort, what to do to change our life the way that God wants us to change it. So I want to talk to you about the why of my habits today. I got three points for you. Number one is this. I'm both flesh and spirit. Everybody say, I am flesh. I am spirit. You're both. Did you know that? That your flesh and spirit? He actually says this, and I read it to you in verse 15, and then also in 18 and 19. But in 18 and 19, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. Everybody say flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. How many can relate to this? You're like, that's me. He actually says, I don't have the ability to carry out the good things that I want to do. So I want you to hear me, church. In your flesh, you do not have the strength to do the right things. In your flesh, you do not have the ability to do what is right according to God. That is the facts. Paul lays it out for In your flesh, it's not possible. Your flesh is weak. And your flesh is prone to the wrong things. Then Paul goes on. I'm going to jump to the next chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 9. He says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Everybody say Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So this should encourage you, those of you that love God. Because if you have a relationship with God, then it actually tells us, look, you are flesh, but you're not in the flesh. 
you are flesh, but you're not in the flesh. You're actually in the spirit. And if you're in the spirit, then you have the ability to do that which you want to do. It's not in your flesh that you're doing it. It's in your spirit and the strength of the spirit of God that you're doing it. The problem is a lot of us are trying to do what we want to do, what we know is the right thing to do in our flesh. And Paul is telling us it is not possible. You do not have the ability. But in the spirit, that is where you find your true strength. And when you find your true strength in the spirit, you can do what you actually want to do, you know you should do, you know is pleasing to God to do. So, hear me in this. We as human beings who are committed to Jesus, are a walking contradiction. We are and always will be people in turmoil. We are of two natures. There is a spirit man and there is a flesh man. We are the spirit and we are the flesh all at once. The old cartoons used to illustrate this. I used to watch Tom and Jerry. Y'all remember this? I know I'm old school. But uh, there's... there's cartoons and Tom and Jerry is just one of them where like you'd see the little Tom evil devil Tom on one shoulder and then on the other shoulder was little angel Tom and they're they're whispering in, in his ears telling him what to do this is the illustration of what you and I experience every day that the flesh is at war with the spirit and the flesh and spirit are in direct opposition to one another and they're fighting against one another. And the flesh is trying to get you to do that which you don't want to do. Because when you know Jesus, how many of you know there is something inside of you that wants to do the right thing? There's something in you when you know Jesus and the Spirit of God is in you. There's something always telling you and pushing you and urging you to do the right thing. But the flesh is still there. And the flesh is always saying, no, no, there's something else you could do. There's something better you could do. Here's what Galatians 5, 17 through 23 says. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. You see that? It's actually against it. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They're at odds with one another. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So listen, you know Jesus, you have a relationship with Jesus, you actually want to do good things, right things. But they're at odds with one another. The flesh is pulling you away from it. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. So Paul actually gives us a list here. He's writing to the church in Galatia. And here's what he says. Here's the, the works of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And I just want to tell you, let's be real probably most of you in this room did one or two of these this last week. Let's be real. And you're like, no, 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 no. He even said things like these. Y'all may have not done those exact things, but you did things like these. Like it was almost these. It was basically these. And so if we're honest with ourselves, we'll go, yeah, you know what? The flesh rises up within me. But then I bet this last week you also did what the next chunk of verses says, which is the fruit of the Spirit. I bet you also had love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. I bet you did some of those things this last week too. So what does that tell us? We are a people at war with ourselves. This is the why. And when you begin to understand this, you go, oh, okay. it makes sense why I struggle. It makes sense why I'm, I'm often making wrong choices. It makes sense why I'm caught up in sin. Why? Because every day we wake up and our flesh battles our spirit. You are at war within yourself. And Paul was no different than you because some of you are looking around, you're going, these Christian people, they got it all together. I bet Caleb, he's, he's the pastor. He never, never struggles with his flesh. No, let me tell you, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This dude was legit. He loved Jesus. And even he says, I do what I don't want to do. And I don't do what I want to do. Why? Because the flesh is at war with the spirit. You have to understand today, you are both flesh and spirit. This is why you're caught up in some wrong habits. Second, 
the why of my habits, is I run on fuel. Everybody say, I run on fuel. Did you know you run on fuel? I'm guessing this morning you ate breakfast. Some of you didn't, but you'll eat lunch or dinner. I'm guessing if you didn't eat at all today, you're like, I'm not going to eat today. Um, I'm going to fast. You, you ate at least one time this last week. Why? Because you run on fuel. I run on fuel. We run on fuel. And I just want to tell you in the same way your flesh man and your spirit man runs on fuel. Did you know that? You run on fuel. Whatever you feed gets stronger and whatever you starve gets weaker. My wife, um, I was looking back at, you know, this is this 10-year challenge right now. Uh, I was looking at pictures from 2010 to 2020. And I was looking at us. We've been married 11 years, so I can go back and look at those. And, and I'm looking back, and I saw this picture, and we were both in tank tops. And uh, I'm looking at this picture, and, and I'm like, wait, wait a second. You see, when I go to the gym, I go for a good time. I walk in the gym, there's mirrors everywhere. You know what that means? Dance party. I put on the music, and I'll go to the gym with my wife. She hates it. She can't stand to go to the gym with me because I'm just goofing around the whole time. I'm dancing, uh, uh, you know, messing around, and she's in there focused. She's working. Well, I'm looking at this picture, and we're in tank tops from 10 years ago, and, like, I look the same. But my wife, like, her arms are bigger. Her calves are bigger. Like, I'm like, no, you're supposed to get worse with age. Girl, you're getting better. Why? Because she goes in and she's focused. She's there to strengthen herself. I'm there to goof around most of the time. And then I go shoot hoops for a while. That's just how it is. So many of us are feeding the wrong thing. And then we wonder why we're doing what we don't want to do. And not doing what we want to do. It's because we got to feed the right person. We got to feed the flesh, not the spirit. Or sorry, switch that. Feed the spirit, not the flesh. I said it and I paused because it didn't sound right. Romans 7, 15. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. You know what I thought was interesting here was Paul actually says, I don't understand my actions. Which actually led me to think like Paul was still figuring this out too. And I hope that you grasp that none of us have it all figured out. Because some of you, you've been, you've been a Christian a long time in this room, or maybe you're brand new. And some of you brand new Christians are like, I'll never be there. Let me tell you, they don't got to figure it out either. I don't got to figure it out either. And I just want to tell you, you'll never have it all figured out. Paul didn't have it all figured out. But I do think as I looked at Paul, I began to understand, like, he didn't understand what was going on. We need to look at that and say, how can we better understand what's going on? You see, I think a lot of us are living with an ROI mentality. Now, I'm going to take an economics class for a moment. You guys know what an ROI is? It is the return on investment. How many of you have heard this term before? The ROI, return on investment. The problem is we take ROI, this mentality, which is really a business mentality, and we apply it to every area of our life. And so we take it into how we're living, And we go, all right, I want an ROI, and I don't know, Caleb, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, these fruits of the Spirit. You know, if you live those, you don't always see an immediate ROI. But hey, I could gratify my flesh in the moment, and there's an immediate ROI. There's an immediate ROI. And so, so many of us are living with the ROI mentality, but we're living ROI in the moment. ROI in the presence. It's why most marriages don't last. Because they go, well, I'm putting these things in. I'm not getting much out. But they don't realize and recognize if you live for the future and you live for the long term, if you put in enough love, joy, peace, patience, kindness into a marriage, over time, you're going to get more out. But you go, no, I'll just move on to the next thing, the next person, the next one, the next relationship. Because I'm not getting the ROI right now. We have to live with the kingdom mentality. A kingdom mentality is long term. A kingdom mentality looks to the future. And that's how you got to think. You see, you could get an ROI in your flesh in the moment. Or you could get an ROI in the future that lasts for a lifetime if you do the right thing. 
So what kind of return do you want? If you want a temporary return, a momentary return, a a pleasurable uh, few second return, then you're going to invest in the flesh. You're going to feed the flesh. But if you want one that's going to last for a lifetime where you're going to see the fruit of faithfulness over time, you're going to invest in the spirit. We have to feed the right thing. Starve the flesh and feed the spirit. And some of you need to hear this today because church is not a priority in your life. And I want to tell you, this is a way to feed your spirit. And I'm not here to call you out, but I'm here to challenge you and tell you, being here, you're going to leave here. You're going, wow, I feel good. Wow, I feel closer to God. Wow, I feel like something spoke to me. Wow, I feel like I, I experienced something, some kind of change. And I'm going to leave here and I'm going to make some, some changes. I'm, I'm going to apply some things to my life. And then you don't come here for another six months. This is a way of feeding your spirit. Just like spending time in prayer, just like reading the word, just like being alone with God. You have to feed the spirit. Most of us in this room feed our flesh far more than we feed our spirit. And I just got to be real with you, and I get caught up in that at times too. I make decisions every day to feed my flesh, but how many decisions do I make every day to feed my spirit? What you feed gets stronger. What you starve gets weaker. I don't think you recognize that side of it. You see, I, I'm married. I've been married for 11 years. And my wife, um, when I married her, I said, I'm going to be faithful to you. And I, I meant that not just with, with my physical body, but also with my mind. And so I, I'm like any other man in this place where we, we were visual and, and I've had moments in my past where lust was an issue in my life. But when I dedicated my life to my wife and I said, I want to marry you, I begin to starve the flesh side of me. I begin to starve the lust side of me. And let me tell you what happened. Over 11 years, I've starved that so much so that I am faithful to my wife day in and day out. Faithful with my mind, faithful with my eyes, faithful with my body. I'm faithful. Why? Because I starved the flesh. Some of you are feeding the flesh and you wonder why you can't overcome that sin. You'll never overcome it if you don't start starving it. You'll never be able to overcome that thing that has you caught up and and in chains and in bondage. Some of you are in bondage to some things in this room. If you were honest with me, you'd probably be ashamed if you came and stood before me. But let me tell you, God and in God and with God, there is no shame. There is only grace. There is only love. And God wanted to tell you today to come before him and say, God, I need your help. Help me starve my flesh. Help me starve this sin. Help me build my spirit. Feed the right thing and starve the wrong thing. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world, the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, pride and possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. I read that too because I think that the other side of this is that there is a culture that is grasping for and working for and striving to get a hold of your life. And I wanted to tell you, and you need to hear me, this culture and this world is inherently bad. And yet most of us are being led by culture. Most of us are being led by the world. We let them dictate what we buy, how we think, what we say. We let them dictate what we do with our money. We let them dictate the decisions, how we parent our kids, how we relate with our spouse. We let the world and the culture dictate so many things. But the Bible actually tells us that the world and the things of this world are going and passing away. There's nothing good in them. You have to begin to shift your focus and say, I'm going to let the word of God, the things of God, they're going to dictate how I think, how I talk, what I say, how I relate to my wife, how I parent my kids, the, all, everything I do with my money. I'm going to let the word of God. You see, we have, have to have a biblical worldview as God's people. And yet this culture is trying to get us to have anything but. 
Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. It's a shifting of our mind if the band would come back. I'm going to close. The why of my habits, you see, I'm both flesh and spirit. I run on fuel. What I feed gets stronger. What I starve gets weaker. And third, I'm going to encourage you today, I am not good. Everybody say, I am not good. Say it again. Say, I'm not good. You see, I often talk to people who who don't believe that Jesus is the Savior, or they don't believe that Jesus is the way to heaven, but they believe in heaven. I often have conversations with people that believe that there's an afterlife of some kind. They believe like something is coming after this. And I have these conversations, and what's interesting is as I have these conversations, there's always this one, we come to this one point where I go, okay, so you, you believe in an afterlife. So you don't believe Jesus is the way. So tell me, what do you think is going to happen to you? And they always say the same thing, which is, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven. And I ask the same question every time they tell me this. I say, well, why? Like, why do you think you will go to heaven? And the same response happens every time. They say, because I am a good person. I'm a good person. And most of you in this room, if I asked you, you would actually say to me, I'm a good person. You say, Kayla, I'm a good person. And I would ask you in response to that, I would say, well, good in relation to who? Because you may be good in relation to a murderer. You may be good in relation to a dictator. But I guarantee you, you aren't good even in relation to another person in this room. You may be not even good in relation to another person in your own family. And the Bible actually tells us that we're not good. And so as I have these conversations with you, I always ask them, I say, well, have you ever lied? Oh, yeah, for sure. Have you ever stolen anything? I mean, yeah, it happened before. You ever lusted after someone, like not your spouse? Oh, straight up. Have you ever done something that you said you wouldn't do? Oh, definitely. You ever been a hypocrite, said you were going to do one thing and do another? Oh, yep, I've done that. You see, none of us are good. Scripture actually tells us in Romans 3, 20, 10 through 12, just to build you up today, church, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands and no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The Bible actually tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in Romans. Everyone. All. So when people say, I'm a good person, I I have to disagree with them and say, actually, you're not. You know, my boys, they'll sometimes do wrong things and make a bad choice, and I'll say to them, like, what are you doing? Why would you do that? And they'll look at me and say, I'm a bad boy. I'm a bad boy. One of them especially always goes, I'm a bad boy. And, like, the theology side of me wants to go, yeah, you are. But the father side of me says, no, you're not a bad boy. You just made a bad choice. I wanted to tell you today, church, that none of us are good, but thankfully Jesus is. Come on. Thankfully Jesus is. You see, the good one is a good shepherd. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So I just told you to say, I am not good. But I want you to say something else right now with me. Say, I am good. Say it again. Say, I am good. Here's the cool thing about God. Is that one day we will stand before God and have to give an account for everything we've done. I don't know about you, but that scares me. I'm going to have to stand before God and give an account of everything I've done. But the Bible tells us something. It says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Here's what happens. 
when you go and stand before God and say, God, I did all these things, you know what he's going to say? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over the little. Come into the inheritance of much. Why does he say that? Because even though we're not good, God is good and his son is good. And the son Jesus takes our sin and takes our mistakes and takes our past and takes our failures and he becomes the sin so that when we stand before God, God says, you are good. He'll say, it's all good. You're good. I can't think of anything to give thanks to God for more than that. That even though I'm not good, I will stand before God and He will say, you are good. Not because of me, but because of Him. Not because of my choices, but because of what Jesus did. This last year, or this last Christmas, just a couple weeks ago, my, my kids, they got tons of presents. And, and I don't give them a lot of presents. Um, but my sister does. <laughs> my siblings and my parents. And, so Christmas came and they're opening all these presents and at first it was like open a present say thank you open a present say thank you but after like dozens of presents it was like unwrap next one unwrap next one there was even a moment where one of my kids like looked at it like eh, and like slid it to the side next one there was this mentality it came to this point where it's almost like I deserve this and I just want to tell you may we never become numb to the good gift of grace that Jesus bestows upon us all. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it, but he gives it to us. Why? Because he's a good God and he wants nothing more than for us to come before the Father and him say, you are good. You haven't been good, but I made you good through my son, Jesus Christ. If you believe in a good God, let's give him some praise in this place today. A good savior, he says, you are good. When I know my why, I know how to try, church. So I want to challenge you today as we leave this place, that you would walk out of this place, you would starve your flesh. You would starve the wrong things. You would feed the right things. You would feed your spirit. And you would leave this place saying, I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to fail. But if I put my faith in Jesus, he'll look into my face and say, you are good because of my goodness. Would you bow your heads with me across this room? If you're in here and you say, Caleb, I need Jesus Christ. If you were honest with yourself, you would say, I gotta, I gotta say, I've actually lived according to my flesh. I've lived for my flesh. And today you need to give your life to Jesus Christ to allow the Spirit of God to inhabit you and to dwell you, dwell upon you for the first time or once again. If that's you and you're in this room and you say, Caleb, I need Jesus. I need to surrender to Jesus. I need to give my life to Jesus. I want you to lift your hand right now in this room. Go ahead, yes. Hands are going up. Come on, church. Hands are going up around the room. Let's give God some praise. That's what it's all about. You can put them down. Also, if you're in here, you say, Caleb, I gotta be honest. I fed the wrong thing. I've allowed my flesh to become too strong. And in 2020, I'm making a commitment to starve my flesh and to feed my spirit. To starve the wrong man and feed the right man. If that's you and God convicted you and you want to make a commitment to feed the right person in 2020, would you lift your hand if God spoke to you today in this room? Yes. Hands are going up all around the room. Can you repeat this prayer after me? You can put your hands down. Say, Jesus, thank you for coming and dying for me so that I could stand before you and you would say, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not because of me. It's because of you. And I thank you, Jesus. Help me to strengthen my spirit to starve my flesh I want to serve you I want to live for you let me implement the right habits in 2020 I love you Jesus in your name amen let's stand to our feet church and let's sing this song as a declaration of how good our God is come on lift your voices with me church